We need the ecological crisis to push us out of our comfort zones. And if you look back, we've, we've known we've been heading in this direction for like a half century, really. Probably we're undergoing kind of an evolutionary process as a species. Like we've, we've developed the kind of perception that we're separate from nature and cosmos and we're just, you know, um, independent and so we, you know, but, but actually what we're experiencing is this rapid evolution of technologies and the meshing together of humanity into a global brain, you know, it has similarities to what we often see in, in nature in the, in the evolution of species and the birth of individuals, you know, the, the way a, the brain of a fetus is formed as all these neural pathways connect, you know, so now, now it seems like, um, you know, and, and, and birth also involves a lot of trauma and a lot of, you know, blood and, and, and suffering and so on. So it feels to me quite likely that we're in kind of an evolutionary birthing process. And a lot of things that are hard for us to understand um, from our present perspective could make sense, you know, from, 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 a, different, from a different vantage point, you know. And um, I think that's a very hopeful way of understanding because nature is, you know, usually intelligent and usually has a way of orchestrating things towards, you know, new and more imaginative ends in a way. So, you know, we, we might be, for instance, on the birth of a true planetary civilization. We might be on the birth of exploring other worlds or creating a financial system that provides everybody with a basic income. It's much easier to see the negative and the shadow of what's possible than it is to see the positive and, and the light in, in what's happening. These three areas of technical, technological, infrastructure, social system, and then also kind of consciousness, which is shaped by culture and media and education. And those are like the three sort of big areas that I think we need to look at. Technically, you know, we, we know what we would need to do in terms of energy. We need to shift renewable energies very quickly. And we're seeing the more, more and more capacity that makes that possible whether it's the evolution of solar, which has now reached kind of grid parity, or the evolution of storage systems, the Internet of Energy, the Internet of Things, which will allow energy to be shared efficiently, you know, so that actually people can become individuals or communities can become net producers of energy and feed it back to the grid. Uh, in terms of industry, the whole idea of a cradle-to-cradle -cradle manufacturing, so you can have like, you know, things that are packaging, being compostable and having seeds in it so that it feeds, you can create new gardens or something. Uh, that in terms of agriculture, shift to renewable, sort of regenerative farming practices, no-till farming, permaculture. At the moment we know that the industrial farming system, according to the UN, is only about 60 years left that we can farm in this way before we can't produce any more food because it's depleting the world's topsoil. But luckily we know there are these other ways of farming. Some of them are not new innovations, they're ancient innovations, you know, but we, we can theoretically learn from the past and, and scale up uh, these types of models. and. Um, you know, shift our direction. I mean, and then there's, you know, yeah, other technological areas. I mean, I'm very intrigued by the social networks, social media, media in general. I mean, the fact that, you know, 15 years ago, something like Facebook that now reaches 2 billion people on the planet every day was un basically unimaginable. So that's like, you know, more than like one quarter of the planet, the Earth's population is now meshed together in a, you know, global communications infrastructure that could allow for rapid evolution of new ideas, social innovations. I'm extremely interested in, basically the thesis of the book is not that we, you know, destroy capitalism, you know, but that we recognize the, the limits in capitalism and that it's a very unsustainable system and we evolve ways to work past those limits so for instance, we could use mass manufacturing to create housing units that are, um, you know, have, that are, you know, are totally self-sufficient, you know, so that people can grow their own food through aquaponics, create their own energy through solar, compost their own waste. There's a Stanford group which is pioneering what they're calling, calling Regen Villages as a model for that. And then you think about how there's like the refugee problem and how these refugees are just being settled into these tent complexes where they're totally dependent from the outside. But what if that's turned around and we're able to create, you know, kind of mass manufacturable housing units where people can support themselves, uh, you know, in, in resilient ways. So I think if we're going to deal with the ecological crisis that we've created, which really is very dire in many respects, it's going to require uh, innovation that's exponentially scalable uh, quite rapidly. And it seems like we've created the, 
you know, the technical means for those, for those innovations to scale with the communication systems that allow everybody to communicate and the distribution of manufacturing systems that capitalism has bequeathed us, but probably we need to make fundamental shifts in our financial system and our decision-making structures to bring about the types of rapid innovations that are necessary. We would need to rethink the game system so that it's not just about financial capital and financial profit, it's also about corporations becoming more like cooperative infrastructure where they're supporting health and biodiversity of ecosystems, uh, you know, health and biodiversity of local communities. And then in terms of the tool that we use to exchange value, you know, that's also something that's just had a kind of uh, inertia of a certain kind of evolution. You know, the idea that you know, money is a fiat currency that's issued by a central bank that's based on bank debt. You know, it, it's a form of currency that forces competitive and aggressive behavior across a society. Because when you go to a bank to get a loan, you know, they evaluate your credit score, which means they're evaluating your capacity to bring back the interest in that loan you know, against everybody else in society. And if they think that you're a good risk, that you're competitive enough, that you're going to be able to make more money than they're giving you, then they'll give you the loan, right? So, that, that, so the, 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 the financial system that we have now is built on artificial scarcity. It automatically creates debt and bankruptcy and anxiety and discomfort, and it does that systemically. You know, so then we can ask ourselves, well, okay, like how could we do, do better than that? You know, if there's enough food and resources for people, could it be a universal basic income? Could it be, uh, I mean, I'm really interested in Bernard Leotard's uh, work. He wrote a book called The Future of Money, and he analyzes the history of, you know, kind of money systems. And he argues there's like um, yin and yang currencies, and there are currencies that actually are more yin that support cooperation and uh, community and so on. And, he proposes an idea of a negative interest currency called the Terra on a global scale. The idea is that um, people would have no, like you would get it, it has like a timestamp on it, so it loses value the longer you hold on to it. So instead of hoarding it, you want to share it back because there's no value in, in, in hoarding it. And what's interesting about the blockchain is that it allows for people to create kind of uh, you know, tokens, cryptocurrencies that are based on agreed upon rules you know, by whoever wants to get involved by, by supporting it. So if, if these ideas you know, gained currency in a sense, you could create tokens or cryptocurrencies or distributed autonomous organizations that had more of this ecological and social benefit kind of built into them. I like this model of thinking about it as an initiation, which is something we see over and over again in films, whether it's like Avatar or Star Wars or you know, Matrix or whatever, that like, um, yeah, that this is like a crossing over point and instead of resisting change and, and, and the dangers of, of what's happening, people could say, okay, this is the, the existential situation that, that we're in and I'm gonna step into it. This is my hero's journey. This is my mission, my initiation. And how can I be the best contributor to, to a positive outcome, you know, for my family, for humanity, you know, for, for the planet as a whole. And then it becomes, I think, very exciting, almost like a, like, like a, like a game or something to see, you know, how much can you, you know, give and how much can you contribute. You know, but yes, I understand that you know, many people are in established structures and they fear for the future. They have a lot of uh, equity in the system as it exists. And um, you know, that's, that, that's legitimate also. But um, you know, it is a time of profound change and, and people are feeling that, that shaking, as, as you said, in, in their value structures. And we also realize that the stuff that they thought they wanted isn't even really that satisfying. And that actually maybe, like for instance, you know, in, in New York, like, you know, you know, there's like, there's a lot of people in their culture, young people in their 20s and 30s, but there isn't like communities that are multi-generational, people really care for each other. And I think it gets tiring as you get older, but actually the, the, these models of the things that would make the planet more livable and thrivable would ultimately be much more satisfying for, for the individual after, after a change that admittedly is uncomfortable and weird and difficult and turbulent, and that we don't even know quite how to make totally right now. So, so it is an experimental time. I understand why people would feel threatened, and you know, but but there's, you know, in a sense, you know, the, the die is cast in certain respects. Like you know, whether with whether with, with technology and automation or with what's happening environmentally, we're ju we're just rap you know rapidly moving into a different circumstance, and uh, we we have to adapt to that, you know, kind of mindset of, of flexibility and fluidity and change.